All right, let's make it happen here. Of course, I forgot to fill up my water bottle before we started. Randy, how badly do you think this is going to go? I should have... Oh, shit. Hey, I, at least I closed my email program, so I won't be interrupted by emails. Not that it makes a difference in my case. I'll still get distracted by something. I like bitching about how I forgot to fill up my water bottle. When the crowd goes wild, I'm gonna go fill up my water bottle. You can scream and shout with all your might. Oh, you can scream, shout, whine, cry, snivel, piss, and motherfucking moan. You can shove your opinion up your ass. That way Obama's cock has something to keep it company. You are wrong or I am right. And don't forget the ever-present, the most likely third possibility. You are wrong and I am right. While the crowd was going crazy, I filled up my water bottle. I am the Great One himself, and this is the Stating the Obvious podcast. It is the weapons platform from which I launched the cruise missile on my intellect. The cruise missile that homes in on and destroys stupid motherfucking statists all around the world. Because, oh, oh, I know. Who would build the fucking roads? That's your greatest intellectual argument ever. Well, who would build the roads? Like Larkin Rose said in this great video, a road is a fucking flat space. And a statist is somebody who's too stupid to make a fucking flat space. All right, welcome. I am the great one himself, Cynical Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com on the internet. In the control room is the lovely and adorable Randy, and if you want to send us feedback, love mail, hate mail, naked pictures of yourself, whatever you want to send, you can send that to God, that's dog spelled backwards, God at C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com. I got a cough drop in my mouth that's going to be gone in a few minutes. Throat was getting a little scratchy. We are, of course, getting a... Yesterday, here in the People's Republic of Fort Collins, we got a great big dose of global warming when it dumped some odd number of inches of really wet, shitty, heavy, sticky snow on us. I think I'm still feeling a little effects from the weather change, unfortunately. So this is part two of a two-part podcast talking about The King of Sports. It's a book. The book is The King of Sports, Football's Impact on America. It's written by Greg Easterbrook. If you have not listened to the first part of this, you need to go back and listen to it. Otherwise, I don't want to hear any fucking whining about how anything doesn't make sense or doesn't have context. And it's a great book. You should look. You, sh you should listen to it. Well, you should listen to it if it's on audiobook format, or you should read it. So we're going to pick that up. We were going to finish recording this yesterday, but by the time we finished part one, I didn't realize it was already 8 o'clock at night. So oh, we both had shit to do. So we're wrapping this up today, and this podcast, like the part one, may go longer than normal, because if, if we make this more than two parts, Randy will kill me. So that's always my out, is that we can go over. It's the great thing about podcasting, opposed to being on the radio or something like that. I can make these as long as I want. I can babble endlessly for hours. In fact, I've done that before. In fact, some people would say my entire fucking series of podcasts is just me babbling endlessly for hours. I can't always disagree with that, actually. All right. Before we get started, I want to also follow up on something I talked about in the previous episode. The movie Saturn 3, which I have been watching. That was the sound of me smacking a cough drop. I know you really appreciate that out there in listener land. Saturn 3. It's more or less about as bad as I remember it. And I'll say this. It's worth watching because Farrah Fawcett back in the day was a hottie pie. And so seeing Farrah running around in lingerie 
is actually kind of worth sitting through. She's pretty damn cute. The other interesting thing about the movie is the robot itself. The so in this movie, the robot is the bad guy. The robot goes on a killing spree, and the robot is named Hector. And Hector is a robot, but his brain is actual brain tissue taken from human fetuses. And there must have been a hell of a lot of human fetuses because his brain, which is in a jar that inserts into his body, his brain is fucking huge. That's what she said. And so there must have been a lot of fetus activity involved in this brain to get that much brain tissue. And it's an, I mean, the whole, the, the robot itself, Hector, is kind of an interesting concept. I mean, Hector is actually fairly scary looking. He's like seven feet tall and he is sculpted to look like a muscular man, but he has this really tiny little beady head because this giant brain of his is actually housed inside his torso. And Hector is programmed. His brain is programmed via a direct interface with the programmer. So the human who's programming Hector does this by inserting a transmitter in this hole that's in the back of his neck and it makes contact with his brain or, you know, this is the sci-fi stuff. And so Hector is able to learn directly from the brain of a human. Well, in the movie, what happens is the human who is training Hector murdered another human in order to get this particular gig of going to Saturn 3 and delivering this robot. Although, one thing that you never really understand from the movie is why in the hell would, even though he's a psycho, even though he's mentally unbalanced, why would he kill somebody and take the job of delivering a robot to Saturn 3? It's really... I don't know. I mean, if I was going to kill somebody in order to take their job, I would, like, I don't know, I'd kill Mick Jagger and be the singer for the Rolling Stones, or I'd kill Donald Trump and own Trump Industries or something. I don't know what exactly his motivation was for this. So anyhow, you've got this guy who is a killer programming the human brain of Hector. Meanwhile... Farrah Fawcett's character, and Kirk Douglas is the other actor in the movie. I think I, I started talking about that and then yesterday and then completely spaced saying his name. How they got Kirk Douglas in this movie, I'm not really sure. I'm sure it involved a large amount of money. Of course, then again, so did Farrah Fawcett, for that matter. So the captain, whose name I forget, who is the psycho, who is, who is the killer, who is programming Hector, wants to have sex with Alex, Farrah Fawcett's character. And now, I'm not really sure that qualifies as being insane. I would say anybody who doesn't want to have sex with Farrah Fawcett in this movie, that would be the insane person. But nonetheless, he's insane and he wants to have sex with Farrah Fawcett. And I don't blame him. And Hector, in addition, picks up on all of this from the captain's brain. And, I mean, this is a fairly plausible part of the movie, because usually in the movies when robots go insane or go crazy or the computer goes crazy, I mean, it's kind of a stretch how you would get there. But in this case, because Hector the robot... Oh, and Hector is part of the robot series called the Demi, De, Demi-God series, if I can talk correctly. So we have a robot that runs on human brain tissue... And we're calling it the Demi God series. What could possibly go wrong with that, right? I mean, nothing could possibly go wrong here. So anyhow, <laughs> Hector picks up killing people and sexual desire from the guy who he's linking brains with. And after that, of course, mayhem ensues and there is destruction and death and chases down corridors and all this other stuff. So anyhow, it's it's not a great movie. I'm like 20 minutes from the ending. And I didn't remember how it ended, but I only know because I was looking on Wikipedia to remember the name of the actor, Kirk Douglas, so I could tell you. 
and I glance at the plot summary and oh there it was there's my telephone ringing in the other room yes I can hear it through the door no I don't no I do not care who it is they can leave a message I would say I'll get an email if it's important but my email is shut off all right speaking of things that are important why don't we by we I mean I why don't I get back to this book the King of Sports, Football's Impact on America by Greg Easterbrook. I'm going to pick up where I dropped off. We're on page 174. Second full paragraph. Here we go. As recently as a few years ago, most states had no laws regarding high school football practice or coaching standards. Not until 2007, for example, did Texas, with the country's most intense youth football culture, require high school coaches to know concussion and heat stroke syndrome symptoms. When in 2006 I became a high school assistant coach in Maryland, I was amazed to learn that I had to give fingerprints and submit to an FBI background check to show I was not a convicted sex offender, yet was not required to know first aid, concussion symptoms, or heat stroke management. The thousand to one chance a coach would be a sex offender was taken more seriously than the strong chance a high school boy would be in health danger because his coach wouldn't know what to do. And there's so much. This, this little paragraph just illustrates so much that's wrong with the situation. This is, and this is going to be an upcoming topic on an episode of Stating the Obvious. It's going to be a response to a YouTube comment and question that I got talking about where I'm always saying that people are afraid and that's what drives a state. And this person was offering a rational and intelligent difference of opinion with me on people's state of fear. But this is a little taste of this. Yeah, high school... So in this high school, in the high school football program, the people who run this are seriously more concerned about somebody being a pedophile, which apparently is not a problem if you're a college football coach and you fuck eight-year-old boys in the locker room, but that's another topic. These high school administrations are so concerned and terrified about somebody being a pedophile while at the same time not having the slightest concern about whether or not high school coaches know anything about first aid. And it's true, it's a lot more likely some high school kid who's getting worked to death during practice by some coach who wants to win because his reputation remember football is is ultimately all about the coaches because the coaches always get the credit or the blame and so when and he easterbrook talks about all this in the book you know the coaches have no incentive to really not push the players hard whether it's high school or college professional because the coaches get the glory, the coaches get the blame, everything ends up on the coach, and so the coach is always going to push the kids, push the students, push the professional players for winning the game, no matter what the cost, because that's what the coach's career rides on, especially since the careers of football coaches are so tied to the results of winning as opposed to overall results, you know, the results of maintaining a good program, the results of having healthy players, the results of how many of your players graduate from high school and then graduate from college and then go to the NFL. You know, there's all sorts of metrics that could be used, especially, I mean, at a high school level, high school football, and I can say this because I come from Texas where high school football is such a huge deal. High school football really could stand to be toned down. The emphasis on it could be turned down a lot. And he talks about that in the book also. But at the college level, you know, the emphasis on college football is 
for the coach to win. And it's the coach who's winning. That's the way it's looked at. And the only metric used to judge the success of the football program is how many games are won. And of course, as a secondary, is how much money comes in to the football program. But of course, that is a factor of the football team winning. As opposed to other metrics at a college football level that could be used to rate and critique and judge a coach's performance could be graduation rates of the players, uh, injury rates of the players. And I mean, that, that's just off the top of my head. There's probably other things as well, but those would be two really good starting points. The whole idea that the high schools are spending money to make sure you're not a pedophile while not spending money to make sure you know anything about basic first aid when you become a football coach or an assistant football coach or whatever it may be, you know, again, illustrates the priorities and illustrates the fact that whenever people in the public schools always say we care about the children, everybody knows that's not true. It's not that hard to provide and to even possibly require first aid training for sports coaches. And that's the sort of thing that probably really should happen. Uh. Although, it shouldn't be a law from the government, because of course we shouldn't have public schools, we should have private schools, where this sort of thing Yeah, it was me getting distracted, sorry. <laughs> we should have private schools where parents can, of course, make the decision about not just, well, they can make the decision about, well, Randy, what the fuck day of the week is it? Monday, thank you. All right. All right, too much going into my brain. Hold it, take two. We shouldn't have public schools where children are forced to attend. We should have private schools where their parents get to make decisions, and one of the criteria parents could have for sending their child to a school is sports participation, and part of their criteria could be that they want the coaches to be certified in first aid by some independent organization, to be trained in first aid by some organization. But of course, all of that is circumvented by the state and by the government. Now, this is the part where I've got in my notes here to talk about, oh, God, I have so much more to go yet. Oh, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> this is where I have in my notes to talk about the fact that public school football and college football is essentially a giant funnel which exists almost exclusively to shuffle people into the NFL so that the NFL, a tax-exempt charity organization, can make money. And so, of course, the individual NFL teams, which are not tax-exempt, which are for-profit and pay taxes, can also make money. But look at... Now, of course, public schools and colleges exist exclusively for the reason of indoctrinating small children into believing bullshit and being statist and relying on the state and being willing to look the other way you know when police brutality happens when the murder of other people in foreign countries happens with flying robots you know to not believe taxation is theft all of this stuff so the, the school system the public schools and the colleges exist to feed the state the corporations are part of the state, so it feeds the corporations. So yada, 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 right? But look at the amount of money dedicated specifically to football programs and the amount of emphasis in high school and in college, I'm talking about as far as money and emphasis, that is placed on football when your only career option 
as a football player is the NFL. All of this money and emphasis and time and effort and motivation is being put into hundreds of thousands of high school kids and college students across the country to funnel these people to a place where their only possibility of employment is with one single corporation, the NFL. Can you imagine if the amount of money poured into football at the high school and the college level and the amount of emphasis and the amount of staffing? You know, like in the last podcast, I talked about how you know, the coaching department for the football team has over 400 employees while the English department has slightly over 200 employees. I mean, can you imagine if that much money and resources and emphasis was placed on training people to work specifically for Bank of America or training people specifically to work for Halliburton and then having a final result where of those people specifically trained for eight years, maybe nine years of their life specifically trained to work at Halliburton, what if only 1% of those people actually got a job at Halliburton and what if most of them were fired from Halliburton in less than three years? The shitstorm, the shitstorm that would erupt from the left-wing statist would be unbelievable. Yet, between high school and college football, we have people being prepped specifically to play football for seven to nine years of their lives. Huge amounts of money, huge amounts of manpower, huge amounts of resources, huge amounts of environmental destruction. I mean, the, envir- the amount of environmental destruction that goes, for all you fucking tree huggers out there, the amount of environmental destruction that goes into a football game is mind-blowing. All of this is poured into training these people to play football. Something they can... All right, yeah, there's, there's semi-pro leagues, and it, it's true. There's semi-pro leagues, and there's the Canadian League, and yada, yada, yada. But how much money can you really make in any of those? And is it all about money and yada, yada, yada? Okay, fine. I, I'm, yes, there are a couple of other options besides the NFL, but not that many. All these resources from the public, public schools, taxpayer financed, colleges, most colleges, taxpayer financed, or of, and of course financed by the tuitions. All these resources into pumping out people whose main, okay, I can't say they're one and only, that's not true, whose main career opportunity is to work for the NFL. Like I said, substitute Halliburton for the NFL. And how do you feel about that? Page 193. me. I'm having a hard time turning the page. First full paragraph. All right. According to Centers for Disease Control Data, and that's the government, so it must be true. It's from the government. The government never lies because Obama's the president and he's black. And if you don't believe the government, you hate black people. According to Centers for Disease Control Data, in 2000, there were more fatalities from illegal drug use than from painkiller abuse. By 2010, the positions had reversed. Nearly 17,000 Americans died after overdosing on opiate painkillers compared to 7,000 deaths from cocaine and heroin. By 2011, five times as many Americans died of painkiller overdoses as died in fires. This is part of an overall context where he talks about the rampant use of painkillers in the NFL because, of course, if you don't play... A game, you might get replaced 
permanently and if you get replaced permanently you get dropped from the team and then you don't make any money and so there's a great incentive for the players to play even though they're injured and if you're injured and you're playing football you have pain well how do you deal with that by massive painkillers he talks quite a bit or writes quite a bit i suppose in this book about painkiller and other medical abuses all right page 222 Hey, suddenly I'm making good progress because some of this I had already covered. Where am I at here? Ah, here he's talking about, so apparently there are high school football camps where, which are this great big scam. And this next bit I'll read just talks about a little of that. Where parents can take their high school kids and, you know, they're, they're being told, oh, there's going to be scouts here from college football teams and the NFL and all this other shit. And which is, it, you know, really re- reading all of this about parents taking their high school kids to these football camps reminded me of the child beauty pageants. You know, these sick parents who take their eight-year-old daughters and cover them in makeup and put them in tight revealing clothing and stick their hair up and parade them around the whole football camp thing to me is pretty much just as sick as that is and perverted and scary and exploitive of the children of course anyhow let me just read this hold on do I want to go back a little bit I do. I'm going to go back. Exclusive MD High Five Star Showcase read the flyer for a gathering at a soccer complex in Landover, Maryland in spring 2012. Quote, this event is a must for any prospect who is serious about playing football at the next level. Unquote. The flyer continued, promising those who attended would score. Quote, all-star game invites and potential scholarships, unquote, while meeting, quote, top college coaches and former NFL players, unquote, plus hearing a, quote, big name keynote speaker, unquote. Boys as young as 8th grade could register. Anyone who paid the $75 fee was welcome. That silence is not in the book. That's me getting a drink of water. Perhaps 600 teens plus parents crowded into the packed indoor soccerplex. Almost all were African Americans. By appearance, many were low income. Ooh, he judged them by appearance. That's racist. Oh, he hates black people. He's racist. See, for those of you who are left-wing statist and still want to support the football industrial complex and everything about it, the corruption, the drugs, the abuse, the shitting on the players, the taxpayer subsidies, all of this stuff, because there are a lot of you out there who are left-wing statists who can't stop sucking John Elway's cock. You know, this is, this is kind of your out. You can accuse him of racism because that's what you accuse everybody you disagree of. Of you, anyone who disagrees with your left-wing statist beliefs, you accuse of racism. That prevents you from having to actually think and engage in intellectual discourse. All right. Anyway, by appearances, most were low income, chasing a vision of athletic glory or of an NCAA scholarship. Boys dream of scoring touchdowns. Parents dream of affording college. Many boys at the showcase were impressively ripped. Barbells and squat racks, once found only in pro sports facilities, are now in high schools. Nautilus and Cybex machines, once exotic, are everywhere as devotees of CrossFit, P90X, and other conditioning regimes. Once, only those training for the Olympics ran gassers and ladder drills. Now, middle school football teams do. Now, high school freshmen have scientific lifting routines with leg days or pec days, timed for maximum muscle mass increase. Because of this, a reality of modern athletics is that well-built young men have become a dime a dozen. A generation ago, 17-year-old Adonis with steely calves and defined triceps would have excited college scouts. Now, all promising high school players are ripped, 
If your muscles don't bulge through your t-shirt, you will be written off by scouts as Jag or just another guy. At the soccerplex, as the soccerplex became warm and sweaty, <laughs> that's what she said, as the soccerplex became warm and sweaty, attendees were separated into groups by position, then put through standard drills as at any football practice. The drills lasted two hours. Parents milled around looking for the impo important college coaches they expected to meet. None were present. Nor was there a keynote speaker, though meals and apparel were sold. Two, reportal, two reporters... Yeah, I'm having lip trouble again. That's what she said. Two reporters from Rivals.com, a recruiting website, snapped pictures. The event was over. It dawned on parents they'd been taken for a ride. 600 kids at $75 a head is $45,000 for a morning that would be unlikely to help more than a handful to be recruited to a college if anyone at all was helped. Everyone received a t-shirt to show he'd been at a five-star event. Showcase t-shirts are high status amongst today's boys, but the t-shirt is all most ever get. Rivals is owned by Yahoo, a company that carries itself as progressive in 2012 appointing Marissa Meyer, a hip 37-year-old woman as CEO, had just reached into the pockets of low-income African Americans for $45,000. Oh yes, yes, there's nothing like having a woman as your CEO because, oh, women, we, let, yes, let's rip on women for a while, shall we? Because, oh, women are so moral. Women are just so intelligent and wonderful and compassionate and caring. And, oh, if only women ran the world, everything would be perfect. But here we see Marissa Myers butt-fucking a bunch of black people with a giant dildo for $45,000. High school scouting, whatever the fuck they are. I'm telling you, it, it, it sounds just like one of these sick little beauty pageants where the eight-year-old girls parade around. It's absolutely terrible. It's disgusting. And it's obvious that, yes, it's a giant fucking ripoff. And it's just a way of the, cor the evil corporations making money. But where are the liberals? Oh, where are the left-wing statists? They're totally looking the other way as I flip through the pages trying to find where are we at here. Page 265. All right, now this is interesting. All of this is interesting. Why do I keep saying this is interesting? It's like I'm desperate to make conversation or something. Oh, this is interesting. Page 265. So why is football so damn popular? Sorry, that's me thinking. Many of you out there would not recognize that because you're statist and you've never done it before. That's the question, and as I've said before, I enjoy watching football now and then. And... The section I'm about to read really made me rethink why I like football. Well, and I just read it, and then I'll talk about my personal experiences and thoughts. And of course, the train's coming too. I always love when the train shows up, or the land whale, as we refer to them here. As to be differentiated from the other type of land whales, which are fat women. <laughs> yes! I can't stop. Oh, I can't stop. All right. <clears throat> oh, what is this guy's name? Oh, Michael... Woo. Mandelbrum? He's a chaired professor at Johns Hopkins University. It's Michael. His last name is M-A-N-D-E-L-B-A-U-M. So that is the professor who is referred to in this paragraph I'm about to read. 
The professor strayed once from international subjects for his 2005 work, The Meaning of Sports. In the book, Mandelbrom lays out the following thesis. Once, America was a pastoral agrarian nation. Baseball was its perfect game, acquiring the label national pastime. Baseball can be played on farm fields, it is not strenuous, so it can be played after a day's physical labor, and is untimed. A baseball game continues till someone wins, the same way maintaining a farm takes as long as it takes. And organizing practices are not essential. People who've just met can choose up sides and start a baseball game. I'll interject here that I find baseball incredibly fucking boring. Incredibly fucking boring. I cannot watch baseball or softball. I mean, maybe if some people I'm or I know are playing, I can get into a little bit, but I can't do it. All of this makes good sense, though, what he's saying here. I still think it's fucking boring as hell, but what he says makes really good sense. Then America began changing to an industrial nation. And I will, this is me talking, not the book. Keep in mind also that America, in going from agrarian to industrial, didn't only make that transition. And he, th this will actually be touched on, so keep this in mind. As time goes forward, the United States is also becoming more statist. You know, by more industrial, we mean more controlled by the corporations, right? When it was agrarian, why did the kids, the kids went to school to get some education, they took off during the summer to work in the farm, yada yada. As public education took over, as the nation became more industrial, aka more statist, what did the purpose of schools morph into? Schools morphed into institutions designed to teach people to work in factories. Okay, then America began changing to an industrial nation. Old-time farmers mainly worked alone or with their families for their own harvest. Factory production requires elaborately choreographed cooperation among large groups. Success for the team is success for everyone. Oh, the team, the team, oh, fucking team. Ugh. As an anarcho-capitalist, I just get more and more fucking fed up with hearing shit about team and teamwork. Because teamwork, well, I've talked about this before in the past, teamwork is always a code phrase for exploitation. People who try to tell you you need more team, you know, when you're at work, well, you're not a team player. Oh, what you mean is I won't let you fuck me up the ass. Because I can tell you for a fact, any I've had enough jobs in my life for corporations, for Colorado State University, for assorted companies of different sizes. Anytime some cocksucker at your workplace comes talking to you about how you're not a team player, what that means is you're not bending, o bending over and taking it deep enough up the ass. That's what it means. Anytime a motherfucker tells you you're not a team player, what they mean is you need to bend over and spread your cheeks. All right, anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Factory production requires elaborately choreographed cooperation among large groups. Success for the team is success for everyone. Industrial output is driven by the clock. Workers are paid based on hours, while management consultants analyze production facilities for time and motion. Thus baseball, a game for a hushed era of farms, was supplanted by football, a game for the Colophius era of factories. Add that only a stick and ball are needed for baseball, while football requires, a lo requires large quantities of mass-produced equipment forged by industry. As more Americans left the cornfield or cotton field for the auto plant, Maldelbum, Ma I can't pronounce this guy's name, Ma Mandelbrum, Mandelbum, Bram, Bram, Mandelbram, Mandelbram, supposes <laughs> Their preferred, sh their preferred sports shifted to a game that is an athletic interpretation of the factory. Now let's think about that for a minute while I take a drink of water. The game of football, 
as an interpretation of working in a factory. Whether you like it or not, you got to admit the analogy is pretty fucking strong. Having worked in a factory, having worked for a manufacturing company, and in a lot of ways it was really a, a good job. I enjoyed working there. But it's true. You know, it starts at a particular time. It ends at a particular time. There's time and motion studies, just like in football. There's people who sit around and watch the films over and over and over, looking at you know, every little detail of what the football players are doing to look for opportunities to improve. The same thing happens in a factory with, you know, in, in football, the team has to work as one. Everybody has to work together. There's one single common goal at the end, getting the ball from here to there. Factory works the same way. Everybody has to be synchronized. Everything has to be coordinated. Just as with manufacturing, like he says, with a football, you've got to have all of this fucking equipment to play football. And we're talking about tackle football. You can obviously you can play touch football with nothing but a ball and some pieces of cloth. <laughs> I said ball, but the tackle football, high school, college, professional, semi-pro, whatever it is, it takes. I mean, God, how many thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands, maybe dollars worth of equipment do you need to do this? And same with a factory. Factories require huge amounts of money in order for factories to exist and function. And of course, just like, you know, in, in baseball, and he talks about this somewhere, it might be in the section I'm about to read. So in something like baseball, there's not really some kind of grand strategy. Each person is acting alone. You go up, the pitcher is pitching the ball. He's pitching what, you know, he's communicating with the catcher. They're trying to pitch something that's going to get past the batter. So it's the two of them against the batter. The batter's making his own decisions. Do I bunt? Do I hit it a home run? You know, what the hell do I do? So it's a very individualized sport. With football, just like in a factory, there is no individuality. Everybody ultimately is taking their orders from the one man, the coach. It's all about the coach. The coach is the God. The coach makes all the decisions. Everybody follows the coach. Just like in the factory where the CEO makes the decision. Just like in the state where the president makes the decision. Well, Obama has said that everybody must buy Obamacare. And by God, that's how it's going to be. There is no thinking for yourself. There is no room for individuality. There is only the collective. Football is a sport of collectivism. As exciting and fun as it may be to watch, and I'll admit, I think it's exciting and fun to watch when the rare occasions come around that I actually watch it. But it is a sport of collectivism. And it's really kind of sad because as an anarcho-capitalist, I can see where the appeal of baseball would come in, but baseball is so fucking boring. I can't watch baseball, so I can't endorse baseball as an ANCAP sport because anarcho-capitalism is not boring. Actually, anarcho-capitalism would be boring in a lot of ways because there wouldn't be wars, there wouldn't be wars on drugs, there wouldn't be cops doing high-speed chases, there wouldn't be people getting beat down and tasered by the police, there wouldn't be flying robots killing people, there wouldn't be aircraft carriers and all this other shit. So in some ways, anarcho-capitalism would in fact be really boring. But the freedom of opportunity opened up by anarcho-capitalism for people to achieve whatever they want to achieve would not be boring. Fortunately, when it comes to sports, there are other team sports which are more anarcho-capitalist in the sense that one person is not coordinating everything. And of course, that would be basketball which I can enjoy basketball now and then, and of course, the greatest sport in the world, women's volleyball, because <laughs> I love volleyball players. And then, of course, there's women's beach volleyball, which is even better. 
All right, anyway, let me go back to read. Randy, how are we on time? Oh, yes, we're going over. Mm-hmm. We knew that. Let me continue reading. I read that. Taking off from Mandelbrom's thinking... Part of football's appeal may be that its structure is similar to the structure of the contemporary workplace. Once, most Americans were self-employed. And actually, soon they will be again, because with unemployment, dive, this, is, this is not me reading, this is me talking. With you know the, the economy dive-bombing and companies going out of business, at some point... You got to consider that the you know and the number of people who work for the government and our parasites don't really count. So at some point, the number of people who are self-employed is probably going to outnumber the number of people who are not self-employed, excluding everybody who works for the government who are parasites and don't really count as far as generating economic activity because they don't generate economic activity. Okay, once most Americans were self-employed. Now most, now most are employees of corporations or government. They are given orders by a boss. The orders may be wise or foolish, but if not followed, things fall apart. That's a football game. The coach is in charge. His orders must be followed, even if the guys in the huddle suspect the coach just called the wrong play. National Basketball Association contests involve remarkable displays of athletic prowess, almost like modern dancing for points. But the players have guaranteed contracts and openly defy their coaches, doing as they please on the court. Who can identify with that? Well, anarcho-capitalists can, for one thing. This is me talking. And there's another thing with foot, with NFL. You know, you can get tossed out any time. I'm not an expert on the NBA either, but he's saying here the NBA players have guaranteed contracts, as opposed to the NFL, where you're just gone at any given moment. And this is, the basketball is definitely more of an anarcho-capitalist sport because, as he says, the and you know if you've watched any basketball or keep up with basketball news, you know it's true. Basketball players go out there and do what the fuck they want. To a large extent, I'm not saying like they're you know shooting people in the head or pulling down their pants and pissing that kind of doing what they want, but they're out there. And again, basketball more of an individualized sport, right? You're out there, shit's happening, it's moving. The individual players see what's going on, they react, they adjust, they make their own calls, they make their own decisions. As opposed to football, a coach sends in a play and everybody executes this one play and then everything stops. All, all the activity stops and everybody just resets and the coach makes another decision. There's no stopping and resetting in things like basketball or volleyball, right? Except, of course, when somebody scores a point or the ball goes out of bounds. But other than that, it's continuous action. Football is anything but continuous action. It's stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Football feels much more like the average person's experience. And this is true, too. Now, I've just read one sentence and stop. And I can see, too, this is part of why this is part of football's appeal. Because football is like an average, emphasis on average, average person's experience. The average person's experience is being told what to do. You will show up to work on this time. You will build this many widgets. You will purchase Obamacare. You will not drive over 55 miles an hour. You will take your shoes off in the airport. You will allow TSA agents to touch the genitals of your eight-year-old child. Right? That's the average person's experience. Being told what to do, not questioning what they're told to do, and executing on it. Who can identify with that? Referring to basketball. Football feels much more like the average person's experience. NFL players may be stronger and better paid than most Americans, but still must obey a boss and will get fired, waived, if they don't do their job as instructed. Do your job turns out to be a common locker room saying in football. Basketball requires God-given height and athletic ability. Size and ability help in football, but every roster has players who were born average physically and made the team through the dint of effort. 
two-thirds of most high school teams are boys who became football players not because they were gifted, but because they worked hard in August heat. Americans identify with football's self-made aspect. That football reflects the American self-view and feels somewhat like the workplace explains how the NFL can rely on a can rely on socialist economics, television revenue evenly split regardless of victories, and the NCAA can rely on public money, yet football has the tint of political conservatism. United States society is dualistic. Americans want to talk about self-reliance, but also receive subsidized benefits. That's football. It looks like dynamic individualism, while grants and taxes, fa- while grants and tax favors underlie everything. And that is some brilliant borderline anarcho-capitalist analysis on his part. It's absolutely true. People do look at football and they think, "Wow, these people." You know, these guys got there through their own talent and working hard and yada, yada, yada. Yet everything about football, high school, college, professional, it's all paid for to a great extent by tax money. The tax breaks, the public funding for building stadiums, the funding that comes from the colleges, the funding for, I mean, all high school football programs are primarily funded by what? Taxpayers. So there is, it's true, there's this, there's this facade of individualism that hangs over football. But in fact, it's a very socialist system. And as he says, you know, with the revenues from the television income, all the NFL teams get the same amount of money, regardless of how well they play. Well, that's socialism. You're not rewarding success, you're just rewarding showing up. All right, what do we got next? 265, that was that. We're now at 268. Whoops. I gotta learn how to turn pages. Hmm? Are we? Nice. All right. We are almost at time. We're gonna let the closing, we're gonna let the closing music play through, even though it's not closing. We could have delayed that, but I'm just too lazy to tell Randy to do that. I don't bother. I'm always right. Besides, this will give me a chance to rest my voice for a second while you guys listen to the delicious sounds of David Gilmour playing guitar. Damn, that was tasty. That's some badass guitar playing. Yeah, we're, I'm doing pretty good here, actually. The very last part where you talk about the reforms is going to take a while. All right, we're on page 268, second full paragraph. That football is king in the United States, but nowhere else may be easily explained. Only the United States could pull football off. Gridiron football is the most expensive sport the biggest sport in terms of performers and support staff, the most complex sport tactically, a sport of most. 
Only the strongest, most affluent nation has what it takes to make football happen. Every weekend in autumn to stage 16 pro games, hundreds of college contests, and thousands of high school games, each involving at least 100 players, is costly body... Each involving at least a hundred players in costly body armor, plus dozens of coaches, trainers, and equipment staff presented in sprawling stadia before a few thousand to a hundred thousand spectators with dozens of games telecast by well-staffed production crews backed by a satellite uplink fans and power generation trucks. Only in America. Yes, only in America can we dump this many resources into sports while at the same time talking about how fucking green we are and talking about, oh, we care about the environment so much. And the environmental destruction that cometh from a fucking football game. Mind-blowing. Ah, just mind-blowing. Where are, where are the global warming wackos on this one? Page 273, second full paragraph. Oh, this is funny. A quirky 1995 book, The Stronger Women Get, The More Men Love Football, is worth recalling. The Arthur, Mariah Nelson, had been captain of the women's basketball team at Stanford, where she set a record for rebounds, and has since found a niche as a motivational speaker. The stronger women get, the more men love football, is thick with failed predictions, especially that men would suppress women's athletics. This turns out to be completely wrong. Not only are girls' and women's sports flourishing in high schools and colleges, broadly supported by parents and school administrators, NCAA women's basketball, volleyball, and softball draw good ratings on television. Many college football and men's basketball coaches go out of their way to support women's athletics since female athletes prove college sports is about more than male interest. Why is this important? Because it once again illustrates we're going to pick on women for a while. By we, I mean I. I'm going to pick on women again. Here we go. By the way, while David Gilmore was playing, I was checking some messages. Speaking of women, you know, it's like, oh, this last minute contact. Hey, can you do some work today? No. No, I can't because you should have like contacted me about this shit a week ago when you knew about it and no I cannot drop what I'm doing right now and come do shit because the world doesn't fucking revolve around you but because you have a vagina you don't really understand that do you alright anyway this is important because this woman predicted that men would suppress women's athletics and this is the female mentality that I've always talked about What happens when a fat woman sees a skinny woman? She wants to drag the skinny woman down to her level, and so she says to the skinny woman, Oh, you're so thin, you need to eat more food. And so naturally, a woman would believe that men, upon seeing female athletes become successful at athletics, would want to drag those women down. Because that is exactly how women operate. Now, I've said before, men, when a fat man sees a skinny man, he doesn't say to the skinny man, Dude, you need to eat more food. You're too skinny. He says to the skinny man, How can I lose weight? Because I want to be like you. When somebody like me, who isn't particularly muscle-bound, sees a guy who has fucking ripped-ass abs and giant biceps, I don't go, oh man, I want him to stop going to the gym and get flabby like I am. I want to walk up to him and say, dude, you look great. What Can you tell me what you do? Like, How often do you work out and what do you do? And can you give me some tips and, and help me become more like you? When a woman sees another woman being successful, right? Marissa Myers. When Marissa Myers took over Yahoo, what's the first thing she did? She dragged everybody down to her level. She 
issued that little order that telecommuting was no longer allowed, that everybody had to come to the office and work because that's what women do. Women say, hey, look, my life really sucks. I'm not going to do anything to improve my life. I'm going to drag everybody else down to where I'm at. And that's why if women ruled the world, everything would be peaceful and wonderful because we'd all be living in fucking caves and wallowing around in the mud wondering where our food was going to come from because nobody would ever fucking accomplish anything other than trying to drag everybody else down to their level. That didn't really have anything to do with football, but it was in the book and I thought it was really interest. There it is again. I thought it was interesting. <sighs> I thought it was interesting. I'm going to say that as if it actually means something. As opposed to when I normally come on the podcast and talk about shit that I don't think is interesting. I don't know. Okay. This is the final section that I'm going to be reading from this, but it's going to take a little bit of time. We're going to go through this, and what this is, at the end... Greg Easterbrook offers some suggestions for ways he thinks football could be improved. And he offers suggestions for college and for professional. Hold on, I'm flipping through this. Does he do for high school? I think he does high school, but it's somewhere else. So anyway, I'm not going to read all of the stuff. Specifically, I'm not going to read the safety stuff. Not that I think the safety things are less important, but because I just don't want to read that because as an anarcho-capitalist, I want to emphasize more on the reforms he is suggesting that happen on a political spectrum and involve the state. Here we go. Good God. Hang on one second. I'm going to look and see what this message is, if this is anything I care about. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, ooh, ooh, I do kind of care about that. One of my favorite bands. Where? Where? Come on, Facebook. Where are we playing at? Oh, at Road 34. Hmm, when is this? Saturday, May 31st. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, I might have to look into that. Not that you give a shit, right? You're sitting there going, hey, asshole, will you just fucking do the book and shut the fuck up? All right, I will do the book and shut the fuck up. I'm sorry for being a scatterbrained ass munchkin on like both of these podcasts. I've been a more, let's put it this way, I've been more of a scatterbrained ass munchkin than normal. <laughs> it's my normal motif, scatterbrained ass munchkin. I kind of like that as a self-descriptive term. I should put that on my business cards. Hi, what's up, man? I'm the great one himself. I'm a scatterbrained ass munchkin. What's well, shaking, baby? You want to get laid? I've got a giant cock. All right, anyway, it has nothing to do with football. Here we go. <laughs> God damn it. Just fucking put me out of my misery now. This is what happens when I have too much fucking work to do. All right. <sighs> my brain, my brain hurts. Here are the reforms that could make football less dangerous, less subsidized, and less harmful to education. First on the college game. Division I football players should receive six-year scholarships with a maximum of five years in athletics. That way, once eligibility expires and the NFL does not come calling, Division I football players will have a final year as regular students, time to complete their credit hours and graduate. That extra year of college at the school's expense would both advance education for athletes and allow colleges to repay football players for the revenue and and publicity they produced on the field. Department of Education Title IX regulations would need to be tweaked so that six-year scholarships apply only to football and men's basketball, the sports that make money at the expense of the athletes' educations. Next one is 
All colleges and universities should be required to present clear, prominent disclosures of the portion of tuition cost or activity fees that goes to the athletic department. Ooh, let me interrupt a second. I saw the other day on the local uh, communist newspaper, the Col- Colorado one. Apparently at Colorado State University, they are raising tuition and raising student fees. Oh, what a surprise. Apparently these student fees, according to what I saw there, and if I remember correctly, are going up something like $212 a year. And they quoted some student being irate about it. Hey, hey, you stupid little fuckers. If you're the smartest generation ever, why can't you fucking wake up and understand that the colleges are just a money-making scam and the college diploma bubble is going to burst soon and those of you going into college right here and right now those of you about to start college at the in this fall you are primed primed for fucking failure because in then by the time you graduate at five years from now oh things are going to be really fucking ugly all right anyway back to reading publicly Funded colleges and universities should be required to disclose detailed athletic budgets, including details of coaches' pay and perks. Consumers deserve to know what they are what they are buying. Tuition bills should itemize the amounts that are diverted to NCAA sports. Taxpayers should know when they are supporting at public colleges and universities. Line items in the athletic department should be public information. Such disclosures might require whoops, such disclosures might be required by the new Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Alternatively, the Department of Education could mandate that any college or university that accepts federal aid must disclose athletic spending and athletic department subsidies. Tying federal aid to public interest reform has worked with colleges and universities before. Actually, no, it hasn't, because if it's worked, then why are colleges and universities so fucked up? The, of course, he's, you know, he's giving you the statist approach is that the government should require this stuff. Of course, the ANCAP approach should be that there should be no government funding. There should be no taxpayer subsidies. None of this shit should exist. And then parents could just be free to say to the colleges, what are you doing with the money? And if the college doesn't want to tell them, the parents don't give them any fucking money. Or the students don't give them any fucking money in the case of students who are actually paying their own way through college. The next solution he offers. The college football rankings formulas for the media rankings published by the Associated Press and USA Today for the BCS rankings and for whatever supplants them when expected when the expected Division I champion playoff is finalized should give one quarter weight to team graduation rates. By extending recognition to graduation rates, the BCS organization and the big school football player organizations could show that they are more than just business ventures. Media companies should voluntarily adopt this standard for college football polls as they have voluntarily adopted many other standards for what and how they report. Uh, and he also talks at great length in this book, this is obviously me interrupting again, about all of the you know, the reasons why the media doesn't ever talk about any of the stuff he talks about in this book is, of course, because the media makes shit tons of money off of football, right? I mean, how much money does a Super Bowl commercial sell for, right? The media that, you know, the, the fourth are the, what is it, the fourth branch of the government, the watchdogs of the government, the source of all truth and knowledge, because it's on MSNBC. It must be true. The media makes so much money off football. And that's why all the scandals and bullshits and abuses and butt fucking and subsidies and taxpayer fuckovers and everything else he talks about in this book. This is one of the reasons why these things are completely ignored by the media. Completely ignored. Today, schools jockey over the second and third decimal places of poll rankings. If graduation rates were a factor, coaches would ensure their players were in class. This reform would not be a panacea, 
but making graduation rates part of the all-important rankings would create a real incentive for college athletic departments to get serious about education. All give lip service to the classroom, few care because their reward structure is based on wins. Changing the reward structure would add accountability to the collegiate sports system. Next one. Sanctions and related penalties should follow a head coach. Head coaches say they deserve high pay because the buck stops with them. But when violations occur, usually the head coach is not held responsible. In 2010, University of Tennessee head coach Lane Kiffin left to become head coach at USC, in part because he knew sanctions were about to be imposed on the Tennessee program owing to events during his leadership. The volunteers were put on four years probation while Kiffin signed a rich new contract at a new school and whistled a merry tune. Well, I, I, can't com I, can, I can completely agree with this. Again, you know, the coaches have all these easy ways of avoiding, you know, so the coach is in charge, he's large and in charge, and the fuck-ups happen in the program, the program, the school gets punished, but the coach bails and goes someplace else. Oh, man, doesn't that sound exactly like CEOs fucking up the corporations, right? Hey, let me completely fuck up at Bank of America, and then the only difference, of course, is that Bank of America didn't get sanctions. Bank of America got bailed out by the government. And then, you know, the CEOs take their golden parachutes and bail. College football, professional football, they're corporations. I've said this before, especially about the NFL. The NFL teams are nothing but corporations. The college teams apparently are not too far from the same thing. One reason college football coaches break NCAA rules is that the reward is great. Victories lead to multi-million dollar contracts and endorsement deals, while the risk is low. Most violations result in wrist slaps or no action at all. Ohio State coach Urban Meyer, known as one, known as one of football's progressive thinkers, has noted that if an 18-year-old freshman breaks an NCAA rule he did not understand, the roof falls on him. Quote, but when a 45-year-old coach does something wrong on purpose, that's called a secondary violation and nothing happens. The coach should receive a serious penalty, unquote. If head coaches knew an NCAA sanction to their old employer would mean they couldn't work in NCAA sports for the same number of years, they would have a self-interest in running clean programs. We should do something we the royal we. If we were going to live in a state of society, which we are, we should have a similar thing for CEOs, right? If your company, if your corporation has to get bailed out by the government, then everybody who works in management, the CEO, the CFO, all these guys, they should all be fired and not allowed to work until the bailout is paid back. Just, just a concept. Just an idea. Of course, yes, I know. Anarcho capitalism, there should be no corporations and there should be no bailouts. That's that's the ideal. But since we live in a world of laws and rules where, you know, one man, the Lord and Savior, Hussein Obama, controls everybody and tells them what to do, and you must buy Obamacare, or you're a racist, and we're going to take money away from you by force. Since you average people love rules so much, that's just a rule. I'm just throwing that out as an idea. I think it'd be good. All right, here we go. One year suspension for the head coach of any football program whose players graduate be below the rate of the student body as a whole. Adjusted for players who transfer and for players who depart early for the NFL. Both of these will always be small numbers. The suspension would follow the coach. If the low graduation rate was at school A and the coach jumped to school B, he would be suspended there. True, literature professors are not penalized if lit majors graduate at below the rate of the student body as a whole, but professors do not control their students' schedules and scholarships as do Division I head coaches. 
College coaches ostensibly claim to be educators of student athletes. It's time they were held accountable as educators. Next one. NCAA coaches should receive bonuses only for academic results, not for victories, conference titles, or bowl invitations. There is plenty of incentive to win already. Is education-based pay impractical, as a coach or athletic director might claim? In 2013, Mitch Daniels, the former governor of Indiana, became president of Purdue University. At his own request, he received a contract with a lower base pay than that of the previous president, along with generous bonuses based on metrics of the university's core mission, including graduation rates and keeping the school affordable to students. Daniel's contract provides him with ample motivation to perform, but his pay increases only if he serves the interest of education. Daniel's is setting an excellent example, one that college coaching should follow. The final one, bowl committees, athletic booster funds, and stadium construction funds should lose their nonprofit and tax exempt status. Oh, excuse me, nonprofit or tax deductible status. Only donations to the academic mission of a college or university should be tax deductible. He then does reforms for safety. Now we come over to reforms for professional football. And with the whole tax deduction thing, again, and capism, there should be no taxes. But this sort of shit, this is why if we're going to have taxes and we're going to have an income tax, because those of you out there who are average people, you 99 percenters, you hate the rich and you just so desperately want taxation because you think that taxation harms those rich people that you hate so much. Oh, you hate them so much because they're rich. But all this kind of shit just allows rich people to get rid of their money and write it off on their taxes and yada, yada, yada. I mean, if you really hated rich people as much as you think you do, you would be in favor of a flat tax and getting rid of all these tax deductions. But, oh, these are tax deductions for supporting football. And, wow, we're all, we're all on board with that, aren't we? Reforms for professional football. NFL headquarters should lose its nonprofit status. Public funding for NFL stadiums should end. Those, let's, you know, there's this shit. Well, but the, but the new stadium is going to create jobs. Oh, I get so hick- sick of hearing that shit. Because you stupid fuckers always say that. But the new stadium will create jobs. Let me ask you something. For those of you who think building NFL stadiums creates jobs, what jobs do you think this creates? I mean, sure, there's construction jobs while it's happening, but that doesn't last forever. I mean, are you going to build a new stadium every year? So the stadium is there. I mean, the football corporation, like the the corporation called the Denver Broncos, they're, they've already got all their employees. They're going to move into the stadium. So essentially, you've built them a free house. I mean, the only jobs that get created at these stadiums are low-paying jobs such as sell, selling tickets, taking out the trash, you know, j- the janitorial stuff, cleaning the toilets, taking out the trash, cleaning the floors, the ticket sales, the support staff. The, n- none of these stadiums are creating large numbers of well-paying jobs. These things are just creating minimum wage jobs for you know, people who have degrees in women's studies or journalism or international relations, rather worthless things like that. These stadiums are not creating jobs the way that, say, a software company or an engineering firm or even a construction company. A construction company creates jobs. Jobs aren't all in the same place all the time and there's fluctuation, but at least it's creating jobs and creating value for people by building things. The stadiums are not creating any kind of meaningful jobs. This is a fucking fantasy. NFL press guides, websites, and similar media should list only the last school from which a player has actually graduated. 
If that is high school, then no college listing. Estimates are that only about 50% of NFL players have graduated from college, yet every press guide, roster, and the league's annual NFL record and fact book list a college after each player's name. For example, since he entered the league in 2004, Steelers press guides, NFL.com and ESPN.com rosters, and the NFL record and fact book have listed Steelers star Ben Rosenthurgelberg, or however it said, as a graduate of Miami University, but Rosenlistenberg did not actually complete his degree until 2012. He's a college graduate today. He was presented to the public as one when he was not. Implying that NFL players have graduated from college makes pro football seem practically civic-minded. Get a scholarship, get a sheepskin, then take your college fight song into the NFL. But when the NFL and the NFL game announcers talk on television about a player's college, roughly half of the time they are deceiving the audience. If NFL players who did not graduate from college were listed by high school, young boys and their parents would have a more accurate understanding of what football at the top level means, entails, and there would be pressure for reform. Next, use levels of prescription narcotics, painkillers, and injected anesthesia should be disclosed by all NFL teams. Currently, apparently, there is no... Well, there's... There's no law! There ain't no law! God, I sound like a fucking statist. Apparently, there's no law that says the NFL must disclose how many painkillers their players are on. Sure. You know, again, without the state, the NFL wouldn't exist because the amount of money necessary to run the NFL could not be brought into bear. I mean, you know, without the taxpayer subsidies for building the stadiums and all this other shit. But anyway, okay, I mean, fine, whatever. He wants a law. You know, Easterbrook is not an ANCAP. He wants more laws. Congress should direct that... Congress, yes, Congress should direct. Like I said, we're not offering anarcho-capitalist solutions here, but nonetheless, like I said, it's a good book. You need to read it. Congress should direct that any professional sports images created in facilities built with public funds belong to... Oh, yes. So this is interesting. I learned this. And I kind of knew this. So remember, that stadium that the Broncos are playing in was built to a large extent by tax money. All the images taken, created in the stadium by the video, by the TV, yada, 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 belong to the NFL. Now, the taxpayers finance NASA, and so when NASA sends out a deep space probe and takes a picture of Saturn, in theory, everybody owns that picture of Saturn. The taxpayers build a stadium for a football team and in the stadium for the football team, somebody shoots some video footage of a guy running down the field. The NFL owns that. And the NFL can sell that and make money on it. And if you use it without the NFL's permission, they can sue you. Okay. Congress should direct that any professional sports images created in facilities built with public funds belong to the public. That would mean the NFL could not sell television's license rights from games played in stadia that were funded by taxpayers. Such images would become public domain, like images from a national park. Currently, there is no federal law on this point. An individual state could enact a law placing images from taxpayer-funded stadia within its borders into the public domain. National legislation that levels the playing field, as it were, across the country would be preferable. The devil is always in the details of legislation that impacts interest groups, so drawing this law would be a challenge. But if the United States can regulate health care, a $3 trillion industry, then Congress can fix a problem regarding football broadcast rights. Actually, the government can't regulate health care. It's going to try and it's going to fuck it up. But again, he's not an ANCAP. He is a statist. He's offering status solutions. The book is still worth reading. Ending the practice of images from public stadia becoming private property 
for private profit rapidly would result in the NFL and its owners paying the full cost of any new stadium construction, while repaying the taxpayer-funded gifts they have been receiving for existing NFL fields. Large sums would be transferred from the NFL's aristocratic owners to the public that made the wealth possible. This would be a healthy development for society and for the sport. NFL owners and executives often mouth empty words about giving back. This reform would result in actual giving back while preventing any more situations in which taxpayers are forced to subsidize, excuse me, forced to finance NFL facilities. And as me closing the book, as I wrap up everything I wanted to talk about. Football. Oh, man. Fun sport to watch, but yes, extremely statist in the way it's played, with everybody obeying you know, the great man who leads them, with obedience being the main desired virtue. And, of course, statist in the way it's statist in the sense of its logistics. I mean, fo- football as it exists right now could not exist without the state transferring large amounts of money from people who work for a living to the parasites that are the NFL corporations, the college sports programs, so forth and so on. The King of Sports, Football's Impact on America by Greg Easterbrook author of Tuesday Morning Quarterback. I highly, highly recommend reading it. Yes, this was a long one. Yes, we're done. Yes, I'm going to shut up. And yes, I'm going to go drink beer with one of my friends in about three hours. Thank goodness. All right, thanks for listening, as always. And bye-bye. Take care, y'all. Have fun.